What a wonderful privilege we have to uh, welcome Michael Slaughter, Mike Slaughter. Um, I had the privilege of being with him 20 years ago when he came to an event in the district I was serving in and uh, knew then that this was a special man of God. And, you know, I couldn't say to you, well, it, because I heard him, I did this and this and this. But I know that having had that experience, my ministry has been shaped in large part by the kind of wisdom that Mike has to offer. When one asks who in all of United Methodism is really leading the church into a new thing, Mike will be the, one of the few names that gets lifted to answer that question. He's respected throughout the, the denomination. He's the chief dreamer of the Ginghamsburg uh, Church, a church which has transformed its environment, has shown that a church in a cornfield can indeed grow. He's truly a spiritual entrepreneur who gathers together those sees the vision, and then enrolls others in the vision. He dares to go where God leads. When he arrived at Ginghamsburg in 1979, the church had a membership of 118 with a worship attendance around 90. Today, the worship attendance is around 4,000. He has a commitment to serve the poor, the lost, the disenfranchised. Jim Wallace describes his experience with Mike after spending a few days working with him at a Change the World conference at Ginghamsburg in 2008 this way. He writes in the foreword to Mike's book, Change the World, of being at the church on a Saturday night when their recovery worship service which includes homeless folks, former prostitutes, alcoholics, drug users, as they were gathering for that worship service. And he says, Mike turned to him with a broad grin and said, Man, if this ain't the heart of God, I don't know what is. He's committed to working with others through seminars and events like this. That's why he's here, because he sees himself as a teaching pastor, not only in his own congregation, but of people like us. And so he gives his time to this kind of an endeavor. He preached at five annual conferences last year and will be preaching at some this year as well. Tonight he'll talk about the theology of being the church in a new way, the undergirding in our relationship with God personally and collectively in all that we do. Before I actually introduce him, I want to give a commercial announcement. He didn't ask me to do this. But these are the books that are available. Spiritual Entrepreneurs, Momentum for Life, Money Matters, Hijacked. And and, uh, you did get your copy, didn't you? He just told us that they've been forbidden to sell this in their church bookstore, but we have them. And so he saw the very first copy when he got here. So folks, this is literally, it's not even hot off the press yet. (laughs) Unlearning church. And then several teaching aids for the book, Change the World. Uh, this and some DVDs, etc. Mike, we are so privileged to have you with us. Would you come up and I'd like to pray with you and then we'll welcome you. Oh, holy and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for your servant, Mike, the anointed one. We pray that you will anoint him for this time. Your spirit will flow in and through him and that we might be reawakened to our own calling to serve you wherever you lead. Amen. Thank Thank you, you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.
the reason my uh, executive said I can't sell that book in our church is she said it's dangerous. And so she told all of our staff to uh, get their resumes ready. I wrote that book with the uh, CEO of Sojourners, and it's about how politics have hijacked a sound biblical theology uh, in, in the church, and we intentionally scheduled it to be released right now during, you know, as, as things heat up. Um, so, matter of fact, some of the things that I say in that book, I said in a sermon a, a, a year ago last Palm Sunday and lost 400 people in one weekend, so thankfully Easter I won 401, so <laughs> I am really honored to be here tonight. I want to say this, uh, I, I come, uh, a Dayton Daily News still called Ginghamsburg Church, uh, a rural church uh, last year, uh, so I went to Ginghamsburg Church 33 years ago almost. In 1979, I was 27 years old, and Ginghamsburg Church was founded in 1863 by a circuit rider, and until the 1920s, it was a part of a four-point circuit. And from the 1920s until I came, it was always served by some of my old-timers still called it Bone Break Seminary. Anybody ever hear of Bone Break Seminary? I still have one of my counters. She's 80, 87 she has turned 87. She counts every Monday of uh, money, and uh, she still calls it Bone Break. Our pastor teaches at Bone Break Seminary. That's United Theological Seminary. Uh, so uh, it, from the 1920s on, it was served by students from Bone Break, uh, then United Theological Seminary. It's kind of been two-year term. So when I was there five years, I was there longer than any pastor since 1863. So I had come, I, I had been an associate pastor in two different churches in Cincinnati, uh, a youth pastor. I grew up in Cincinnati, so, you know, I didn't really know about uh, rural. So the uh, district superintendent, the bishop didn't know who I was, but the district superintendent said to me, if you do a good job here for two or three years, we'll move you to a town church. And we're three miles from Tip City. Tip City has about 6,000 people, you know, and the town church had a uh, Tip City Methodist Church you know, had like two, two, 207 average attendance when I went there. And Ginghamsburg Church had 90, they said, but in my first year there, it grew to 60. <laughs> so so uh, uh, they said if I did a good enough job and then I could move to a town church. Well, in 33 years, I've not done a good enough job to move to a town church. And, and what is amazing, and, and numbers aren't really the measure, it, it, it numbers can be a very a false measure. Uh, Jesus distrusted numbers. But Gingersburg today is the fourth largest church in our whole United Methodist Connection, which is really amazing considering where it is. We're 16 miles north of Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio has declined over 40,000 people since I've been there. We have a population of about 139,000 folk in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, we have lost 34,000 manufacturing jobs in the last four years. So you see the depressed economy. Our food pantry four years ago was serving about 300 families a week. We're doing about 1,500 families a week now through the food pantry. So you see, um, you can uh, buy a house in the one neighborhood where one of our uh, campuses is located for $5,000. Most expensive house in that is, is 19000 So, you know, it's not the kind of place, you know, my great friend Adam Hamilton, he and I are great friends, but I'm not in Kansas City, I'm not in Cincinnati or Columbus, Ohio, I'm not in Philadelphia, I'm in Ginghamsburg. Now, Dayton, uh, Forbes magazine is named Dayton one of the ten fastest dying cities in, in the world and one of the ten emptiest cities in the world. Some of you know I'm in Darfur, I work in Darfur also, you know, we've, I'll let you know more about Darfur in our time together. But Darfur has been named the worst humanitarian crisis in the world right now. So why I love to be in the Daytons and Darfurs of the world is because God does God's best work in cemeteries. You'll get that. Just keep thinking about that. <laughs> right? Is that not, aren't we people of the empty tomb? 
So I honestly believe everywhere we serve is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to do miraculous kind of things. Now, I want to show you today. I mean, I've not been moved from Ginghamsburg. We have over 4,000 folks a week. That's our attendance. So here's where we're going in my three sessions with you all. Tonight, we're going to talk about the foundation, theological foundation for the missional church. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to talk about strategy. So pastors, we're going to talk about strategy uh, and the importance of strategy and how every pastor, I'm going to talk about three things, get specific, how every pastor needs a picture, a plan, and a consistent practice for a movement to take place. So tomorrow we're going to look at your picture. We're going to talk about your picture, your plan, and, and your um, persistent practice. And then uh, tomorrow night we're going to talk about building people for the mission. So that's kind of so we're going to start with the theology. We're going to go to strategy, and then we're going to talk about building uh, people for for the mission. Does that sound like a good place to go? Okay. What I want you to do is is turn to uh, the person next to you right now, and I want you to answer this question. Think about as many specific characteristics. What are characteristics or the measures of an effective church? What are the characteristics or measures of effective church? Share that with the person next to you. Come up with as many things. What are the characteristics or measures of an effective church, an effective ministry? What's your name? Nick? Nick, what did, what did you guys talk about? What are some characteristics of effective church uh, being efficient outside the church walls. okay mission outside the church walls right now when i went to gingensburg church they called that two annual chicken noodle dinners and an annual christmas bazaar and what i said is jesus didn't die for chicken noodle dinners and bazaars why do you think they call those things bazaars anyway <laughs> right what what are some other mission outside the walls of the church what what else right here To go for the vision, to take risk, yeah, yeah, to take risk, risk taking uh, mission, risk risk taking mission, a mission based on vision, not on you know. Well, yeah, that'd be a good thing to do, but we can't afford it. Yeah, that's right. Let's test. You know, go ahead. Vision was we wanted to play with us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just look where we are. Yeah. Need to move those folks out to the cemetery behind the church. What what else? Right here. Meeting the need of the community we serve. Meeting the need, being incarnational to the community you serve. Meeting the need of the community you serve. Anything else that's not kind of in that that we're leaving out? Back here. Okay. Meaningful, memorable, and inspirational worship. Prayer. Right. I was up in my study at home at 3.30 this morning doing just that. Because I can't do that this tonight if I wasn't doing that this morning. Back here. Yeah, you. Plaid shirt. Simple structure. Simple structure. Simple structure. Yeah, simple. Or I always said this. I had a met with a group this afternoon. Simple organisms multiply faster than complex. That's important. We get into strategy tomorrow. That's very important. Right next to you, yeah. Place where spiritual journey, spiritual work, spiritual growth is happening. Right. And you can't, and one thing about what I love about us as Wesleyans is you can't separate spiritual from material. You know, it's it's the whole together. Anything else back here? Hospitality. Wow. Right? Now, we're all, this is what God has called us to lead. Right. This is what God has called us to lead. Now, one of the indicators I, I'm, I'm a product of the church growth movement. Now, I want to say this so I don't sound too negative about the church growth movement, because you're going to discover I'm the unmega mega church pastor. Is the church growth movement did two valuable things. One is it, it really reminded us that unchurched people matter to God. And two, it reminded us that that uh, ministry was based on gifts, not profession, and belonged to the laity. Gift-based ministry. 
laity and uh, unchurched people matter to God. Now, the problem was is that we began to measure effectiveness on the basis of attendance. And so as a young pastor, uh, 27, my DS sent me to a conference uh, church growth conference, how to break the 200 barrier. Did any of you, how many of you remember that? Those kind of com- how to break the 400 barrier, how to bait. So uh, some of us uh, became effective in doing that. And, w- and we studied methodologies and church growth. Uh, instead of like, we're talking here about prayer and, sp- and, and spirit church growth. And, and they, they talked about the science of church growth. And, and a lot of the, it's important to know, like they talked about the 80% rule. That if your space became 80% full, you need to multiply uh, more space. And that's why we begin going to uh, other worship times. And so instead of doing one service uh, in the little country church, I did two. And then when I did three, we plateaued at 294 because we were in that little two-room country church. And then we moved to another uh, another space. And then I started Saturday night uh, also uh, at the... Uh, uh, same time. And then you, we learned about parking lot, excess parking, and if you didn't have parking and all this kind of stuff. So it, it, it kind of became very much based on technique and numbers. And so part of what came out of the uh, church growth movement was the mega church. In 1992, there were only 94 mega churches. That's 2,000 or more in attendance in all of North America. Uh, today, there's about 1,250 megachurches. The uh, United Methodists, we have 24 megachurches in our, our denomination, 2,000 two or more uh, in, in attendance. But what a lot of us discovered, and for me, it's when I wrote the book uh, around 2000, Unlearning Church, is we were kind of replicating what my parents' church did in the 50s and 60s. When we built, that was the, the time of the mainline denomination. When our, when our uh, dads came home from World War II, the baby boom generation, and we built these tall steeple churches, right? <laughs> and and uh, so they did a great job of collecting crowds of people with low bar expectation. And in the baby boomer churches, uh, by that I don't mean we were pastors, we were the children. Uh, so these churches taught members a consumer mindset. Here comes these young families, so we'll have children's programs, we'll have vacation Bible school programs, uh, we'll have all kinds of programs to serve young families. So the, the, the consequence of the success of the, the uh, uh, mainline, which was the 50s and 60s, is that we are mainline because uh, we catered to the majority of Americans by serving their needs. So you became a member like you became a member of a club. It had nothing to do with lose your life to find it. Or if anyone wants to come after me, uh, they must take up the cross, uh, deny themselves. Or if anyone wants to come after me, they must hate their mother, father, brother, sister, husband. What was that about? Jesus, you need to go down to Joel Olstein's place for a while. Man. Somebody better straighten him out. So the church growth movement was doing something very similar. We were doing a great job. I mean, with entertainment, uh, contemporary worship, media, drama. I mean, we were learning how to attract, you know, attract crowds. And some of us did a pretty good job. But I became frustrated and I looked around and I thought, you know, here I am, I'm in my 40s, and am I going to give my whole life to do things like pastors in the 50s and 60s to build tall steeple churches that, how many of you in a tall steeple church today with 100 people in it, you can't afford to keep the doors open? You see, so uh, I said, I don't want to give my life to this, to just inspire people to live little better lives. You know, I want to give my life to the mission of, of Jesus Christ. And what I saw was happening. Same thing for church growth churches and mainline churches of the 50s and 60s. We were attracting soft, secular people who were bringing Jesus into their worldview instead of being transformed into his. So if they were Republican, Jesus was a Republican. If they were a Democrat, Jesus was a Democrat. And I was frustrated. So instead of being transformed into Jesus' worldview of the kingdom of God, whatever they were, they were making uh, Jesus. So I want to just, so you know, I'm going to basically, and I want you to identify where people are in your church. The majority of people in our United Methodist churches 
are soft secular people. Now, here's there's four worldviews in American culture right now. Here's the four worldviews. Here's what a worldview is. A worldview is a set of fundamental beliefs that determine primary life values, decisions, and actions. It's a set of fundamental beliefs that determine primary values, decisions, and actions. The first worldview, and you don't see many of these in church, in, in, in the church. Uh, you'll see a lot of them as college professors, however, and some of them as seminary professors, is a secular worldview. A secular person is totally skeptical of anything supernatural. And they act or do life as if there is no God. You see how secular American culture is? We can do everything. We can do education. We can do economics. We can do politics. We can keep God out of the picture. That, that's a pure secular uh, kind of culture. It's a humanistic worldview where the basic premise is that human beings need to depend on themselves to create their own meaning and determine their own destinies and values. And it's a materialistic worldview that says nothing exists outside of matter, so you place your trust and draw meaning from the material. Now, you don't see many people. The only time you're ever going to see secular people in your church is if they go home to visit mom or dad at Christmas. You know, mom's 85 and they're 58. And uh, they go, okay, mom, I'm coming to church, but they're angry every time they're there. That's the only time you see them. They're not, they're not people who are hanging in your church. As a matter of fact, in my era of seminary, uh, you know, we had professors, seminary professors, who weren't part of any church. Any of you ever know per professors? <laughs> yeah, I think that's changed. You know, as I travel to our Methodist seminaries and speak in our Methodist seminaries, I'm not seeing that, you know, uh, in this uh, post postmodern kind of era like it was in the age of, of modernity. Now, a soft secular are the majority of people you're going to find in a United Methodist Church. They believe in God and probably even profess faith in Jesus Christ, but they trust the materialistic values of our culture. Do you see these folks? They, they trust, they, they don't trust God's promise of provision. They trust their material possessions to give them security and from which they find meaning. And this is why so many people in the Methodist church make donations, but they never sacrifice. Not just the Methodist church. I'm speaking to Methodists tonight, but the American church. Matter of fact, the, the average church person in america gives 2.38 percent of their income and in the evangelical churches where they say they believe the bible more literally they give about 3.2 percent of their income we've got we've got a uh stewardship uh problem in the church and part of it is because our people are soft secular do you see that in your church the majority of people now uh, also you'll see again what are they doing they're bringing Jesus into their worldview instead of being transformed into his. Now, post-secular folks, and, and again, we don't see many of these in the church. They don't relate to the church. They're also called postmodern, but they're open to the supernatural. You'll see some of these folks in your church. But they believe in what's called expressive individualism. It's true if it works for me. So it's very much centered into today. They're convinced that the present is the only thing that matters, and anything in the distant past or future is irrelevant to the expression of self-truth. So there's not this sense of covenant responsibility to tie the past to the future, this promise of the past uh, to the future. So a lot of times you'll see people like this come into a church and make a, a, what appears to be a sincere profession of faith but when it means a missed opportunity in a relationship or a setback in career, they just as quickly bail. Have you seen any of these younger folks? And, and again, they're bringing Jesus into their worldview instead of being transformed into his. Now, here's the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview says it's bigger than my life. Truth will work and prevail because it's true, but it may not prevail in my lifetime. Truth may cost me my life. Uh-oh. Are we telling people that? Jesus said you have to lose your life to find it. So it's not about me. It's not about my wants. It's not about my passions and need. It's about God's greater purpose. And obeying truth may lead to ostracism, persecution, rejection, and even smaller churches. 
Should I go home now, Bishop? When those of you who are with me this afternoon know that. I, in my first year, uh, my church growth movement was negative 30. Uh, I've gone through at least three seasons of lo- losing 400 people at a time. You know, and I even played part of the sermon uh, today. How many of you were in the group where I played part of the sermon that got people upset? And, uh, you know, because we have to do church well doesn't mean that we lie to people about what Jesus is calling them to do and be. So I became, you know, here I was. Now, all of a sudden, I'm a mega church pastor. I have all these folks, and I see a whole lot of soft, secular people. I don't want, uh, I don't want to give my life, man. You know, uh, man, I was 45. I was almost dead. I didn't want to give my life to something that wasn't Jesus, that wasn't about the kingdom of God. So what I did is I began to look at the scriptures. What, we, what the church needs to do is reclaim. The hermeneutic of Jesus. And Jesus was considered a heretic by the Orthodox folks of his day. Do you remember that? What is the what is the hermeneutic of Jesus? How do we reclaim the message and mission of Jesus? And so I began to study the scripture and I said, okay, what what is the the, the description in scripture of what the people are God supposed to be? And I saw three things. One is the great requirement. That's Micah six eight. What does the Lord require you to do? Didn't say suggest. Right. But to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Didn't say study or vote on it. Methodists are good at studying and vote on it. To do justice, to love mercy and walk humbly with God. Secondly, is the great commandment. And Jesus, what did he do? The great commandment was to he put two together. He put Deuteronomy and Leviticus together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and your neighbors yourself. But then he even put skin on it when he said, I give you a new commandment. Remember what that was? To love others as I have loved you, by this all people will know you're my disciples. Not about your by your worship styles. Not about uh, that you all agree exactly on the same issues, right? But the the demonstration of sacrificial radical love is how the world will know you are my disciples. And then the third is the great uh, uh, commission. What is the great commission? Go, therefore, in all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and, lo, I am with you always, teaching them to observe all I commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the, the end of the age. So I said, that's right there. The, the, the great requirement, the great uh, uh, commandment, and the great commission, that's what the church has to be about. And what, we have a great mission statement at United Methodist Church. What is it? For the transformation, it doesn't say anything about making members or attenders, right? But to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Now, what I want to do tonight is just lay the foundation, and I want us to look at the great requirements. So if you have your Bibles, um, we're going to go, great requirement, Micah 6, 8. We're going to look at Isaiah 58 in a moment. Not right now. We're going we're gonna to start, but we're going to look back at the Messianic passages. We're going to look at Isaiah 58, and we're going to look at Isaiah 61. So if you want to look ahead, you can turn there. Act justly. We have power with God by our actions towards people, especially the poor and marginalized. I'm going to say that one more time. We have power by God by our actions towards people, especially the poor and the marginalized. How many of you last year did it freak you out when Glenn Beck came on his TV show and said, if your church talks about social justice, your pastor or priest, leave? Do any of you remember this? I don't know. It's part of why I wrote this book, Hijacked. I don't know how some of my people think Glenn Beck is the Pope of Protestantism. So all of a sudden, these people, some of these people at Gainsborough Church, it's been used to the, well, we're working. We've, we've had busloads of people go to Washington to march on Darfur. We helped in the referendum vote with the uh, 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 Sudanese last year in getting people to voting places that they could vote, Sudanese that were in America. We've worked with the poor for years. But Glenn Beck, all he has to come on and say is the Bible doesn't talk about social justice. 
there are over 2,000 references to social justice in Scripture. Now, here's what blows me. Oh, 2,000 references to social justice. Guess how many references to the new birth? Five. Now, implications all over the place. I believe in the new birth. I'm born again, please. But how do we have blinders on for whole sections of Scripture and build theologies? Are we on the same? Are you with me on, on, on this one? Now, listen to just some of these passages on justice. Psalm 916, the Lord is known by his justice. How will the world see that God is present, not by our ability to verbalize what we believe, but the demonstration of God's justice? And the people have to look at that and go, wow, what is that about? Uh, Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, your kingdom. So wherever God is in control, righteousness and justice will be the foundation of that. Deuteronomy 16, 20, follow justice and justice alone that you may live, live and possess the land the Lord, God, uh, the Lord your God is giving you. Turn to Isaiah 58 now. Isaiah 58. These are, are the messianic passages through which Jesus, this was Jesus' Bible, through which Jesus understood his message and mission from, from these passages. Now, Isaiah 58 begins with Israel crying out. They're living in a time of great distress. Isn't it amazing when we have time of distress, I will turn to God? Well, I want to tell you what. Our attendance on 9-11, before 9-11, was about 2,400. The next Sunday, it was 4,300. We didn't have a place to put all the people. How many of your churches did people just... The, the next week, we, we even had speakers out in the entryway uh, to our church. Third week, everything was back to normal. So Israel's living in a time of, of great distress. So people, you know, are, are doing all kinds of religious things now. They're watching religious TV. They're going to prayer meetings. They're doing everything that looks pious. And so they ask God this, this, this question in verse 3, why have we fasted and you don't see it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you don't notice? Why, why, why are we doing all this? We're showing up for prayer meeting. We're doing this. We're having chicken noodle dinners and bazaars. And there's just, there is no power. No one's coming to church, right? And here's what God, uh, here's what God says. It says, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. See, issues like health care and stuff are important. You know, we just know uh, that's, uh -uh, uh, that's politics. This is religion. No, it's all one and the same. You can't separate that stuff out. You exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fist. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a person to humble themselves? You know, doing all of the religious things, singing the right hymns, wearing the right, you know, what colors do we use in this liturgical season? <laughs> uh, is it only for bowing one's head like a reed, for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set oppressed people free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn. Then your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, here I am. Now, if you read these passages, because this is Jesus' Bible. This is how he understood his mission. This is the movement in which he was going to uh, lead his body, the church. Now, go over to Isaiah 61. Because this is the passage when Jesus came into the synagogue in his hometown. He didn't read from Luke 4. <laughs> he read from Isaiah 61. And this is what he read. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
If it is not good news for the poor sisters and brothers, it is not the gospel. He says, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. In other words, he was saying, now is the year. Now the movement has become. As a matter of fact, that word, he has anointed me, is the Hebrew word Meshach, which is Messiah, is, 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 is that word. To provide for those who grieve. Now go down to verse 4 and you see what the people of this movement will be doing. They will be rebuilding the ancient ruins. They will be restoring places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. In other words, they're not going to be sitting around passively waiting for Jesus to return. They're going to be actively participating with him in the restoration of the kingdom of God. See, the Bible doesn't teach. Jesus didn't believe in a disembodied heaven. That's Greek. That's Gnostic. You know, uh, Jesus believed in the creation, recreation of a new heaven and new earth. See, as Christians, what we believe is uh, not in a disembodied existence. We believe in the resurrection of the body, of the physical, that God is restoring all things. When people say creation is bad, how can anything God created be bad? It's not bad. It's broke. And, and the people of God, what will we be doing? The people of the, uh, of, of the Messianic movement will be rebuilding the ancient ruins, restoring the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities. That's why I want to be in Dayton. That's why I want to be in Darfur. What do we have to cl- <laughs> complain about, sisters and brothers? Jesus Christ is res- risen from the grave. He said, the things I do, you will do, and even greater things than this. Whoa. Then you drop down to verse 8, and it says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and inequity. We have power with God by our actions towards people. You see, what we exist is a community for one purpose, to be God's expression of justice. Do justice. Not get in your Methodist meetings. I'm going to fly from here down to pre-briefing for General Conference. I'm leading our West Ohio delegation to General Conference. But he didn't call us to go and, and, and vote on justice. He called us to be communities of justice. 